Welcome to You Talks brought to you by State of You. Hi everyone, my name is Christina Adana. I am a youth board member at Kids Rights and um I'm a yeah. campaigner. I've done a lot of work with an organization called Fight Back 2030 here a youth led movement in the UK aiming to fight the injustices of the food industry. This is why I think I'm basically the perfect person to interview our guest, Camden Francis. Would you like to introduce yourself and who you find inspirational? Yeah, hi everyone. My name is Camden Francis. I'm currently 19 years old and I'm the founder of uh, Beyond the Crisis, which is a nonprofit that distributes food and resources to like housing communities and homeless shelters. And what we're really trying to do is mobilize efforts around kind of ending food insecurity. Um, a person I look up to, I have so many um, mentors, but one person in particular is Drew Barrymore. I was actually on her show um, and she utilizes her platform for good. And that's something that I inspire to do as I continue to grow um, my platform. And another thing that I do is I'm involved in a lot of podcasts, youth talks like, um, like today. And I also have done some work with the White House around food insecurity. And we're um, building a systemic approach to ending food insecurity by 2030. Um, and I'm working with cabinet members and a lot of congressmen to kind of make that happen. Okay, that's huge. That's like insane. Um, let's take it all like take it all back to like how old were you when you started all this and um, when you started Beyond the Crisis and tell me about that journey. You know, from being a what a teenager to working at to working with the White House. Yeah, so I was sixteen when I founded Beyond the Crisis, and I did it with my younger brother Colton, who's currently he's at school today. Um, but he was a big help in the process and. He was actually 13 at the time, so we were very young. But in the beginning, we were, really weren't taking seriously. Um, have you kind of had the same um, experience? Because like of our kind of adolescent years, um, it was very hard to kind of establish a network. And it's critical to kind of have a network to do anything like podcasts um, and a platform to do the things that you really want to do. And why why food insecurity? Like, what's what's the personal story there? Why did you decide to um, start up an organization like Beyond the Crisis? So we centered it around food insecurity because it's a major issue that's really not addressed enough in today's kind of media. Um, and we really wanted to make um, an immediate um, impact, an impact that can really help children and families in need. And if you're food insecure, what most people don't know is this is a rippling issue that affects kind of adolescence growth and development. And a lot of kids in school right now don't have enough kind of food. And if you don't have enough food, you can't pay attention in class. You can't kind of succeed, get good grades. It is very, um, uh, it's a big disadvantage to kids in need and kids in general. And everyone, we believe here at Beyond the Crisis that food is a right. Um, that everyone should have. For sure, I completely agree. And it's about nutritious food as well, isn't it? Because, I mean, in the UK, like a lot of big food company selling point is that we feed poor families because our burgers are 99p when actually you're contributing to diet-related ill health and, um, you know, diseases that are more prominent in poorer families because of the fact that they're targeted by big food companies. Um, how have you found nutrition and and um the prevalence of food deserts to be a barrier to your work um it's actually we don't look at that as necessarily a barrier it's kind of how we started we started because of kind of the um impacts of kind of areas that have a surplus of food and areas that have none and our organization is based around re um Circul the recirculation or redistribution of food and supplies. So we're taking food from areas that um, have high access and we're redistributing it to areas that have lower access. And that's gonna create kind of, kind of a balance of food across a wider plane. And that's kind of why we've done work with the White House because um, through our research, we found that there's enough food to go around to end um, global food hunger. Um, but we have to take an approach that can kind of reduce food waste and redistribute it around broader areas. And again, like you said, um, 
kind of making sure this food is nutritious and it's really going to aid in youth development um, and family health. So we can kind of reduce kind of a lot of the health issues that come from um, unhealthy eating and stuff like that. And 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 you've mentioned the um, White House conference uh, a couple of times. How how was that working on the first conference on nutrition, hunger, and health in fifty years? I think. Yeah, um, that was an, it. Was an amazing experience. Um, you've really done your research, but it was it was it blew me away. Kind of being with people who were twenty years my senior, discussing these serious issues, and um, like fast forward, we founded it this organization in 2020, but fast forward two years, like I started to really feel like, you know, um, my voice has been heard and that's always kind of a good thing um, for entrepreneurs and kind of activists in general, when they feel kind of that their work has finally paid off and that they're really going places. And we kind of plan to continue um, and stay present and focused, but it was kind of just um, definitely a stepping stone in my experience. Have you kind of had any stepping stones in your kind of journey as an activist and youth leader yourself? Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's crazy because there are so many parallels. You started in 2020, I started in 2019. And um, it's been a journey for sure. Like COVID was mad in terms of like, just, you know, the issue becoming even more prevalent and even just worsening in terms of like young people's health and the lack of access to nutritious food. Um, but, I mean, that kind of exposure to the issue also meant that, you know, there was more media around it. So um, in the UK, I led the campaign um, for free school meals, um, which led to, I don't know if you know Marcus Rashford, the footballer, campaigning to extend, yeah, campaigning to extend child food poverty in the UK. So it's definitely become a conversation, um, which is great, but it's, at the same time it's sad because it's worsening especially due to the cost of living crisis the rise the rises in food prices of up to 40 percent um so the work is definitely needed like yeah. it's it's definitely. insane yeah um i was gonna ask what's it like setting up an organization with your brother like how what's the family dynamic as well as you know the, the business side of things yeah, so um, working with my little brother has been amazing. Um, I started this organization really to kind of mentor him and to do something um, together. We're super close. We've been playing sports together. We, we work out and train together, but it's just another experience to have with him. Um, but really founding the organization um, in the beginning, it's it was definitely a process and it definitely took extreme amounts of patience and resilience and it taught us kind of so much about kind of what it means to be an entrepreneur and a lot of people kind of um, talk about entrepreneurship in this society but if you haven't really gone through the process maybe done an internship or founded an organization it's really hard to experience um, what true entrepreneurship is like because it's not always fun um, it's a lot of kind of laid out or long days and late nights, but it really kind of is a process that's taught us so, so much. And we've definitely reached out, grown our network and even done some mentorship mentorships um, here and there. Have, do you have a mentor yourself or who is someone that you kind of look up to or, or are enamored with? Um, that's a good question. I think like first and foremost, like the young people, for sure, like, um, as I said earlier, we're a youth-led movement. And so being able to see, like, young people use their stories to create change is incredible, right? And you see that on a day-to-day -day basis. It's not just, like, these pop shot activists. So, you know, it's, it's the people around you every day. Um, and I think also family. Like, same with you. Like, my family has been really central to the work that I've done because it's my younger siblings that first motivated me to even talk about this because I was on preschool meals um they're growing up on preschool meals so it's a you know it's an issue that really hits home yeah. mm -hmm. um and I I think I think what you do is pretty cool but I'm also like through my personal experience I know how difficult um balancing work and and my youth has been like actually just being yeah. like so, a young yeah. person and just living like how has that been for you has it 
felt draining at times? Do you feel like you, you're older than you are? Do you feel like your youth has been stolen from you or that you're being young, if that makes sense? Yeah, I was thinking about this a few days ago and I watch a lot of YouTube and kind of a lot of like the people I look up to um, who are entrepreneurs or fitness influencers and who are still young, like in their 20s, they talked about kind of how um, like their their work life balance can be a little bit thrown off. And I completely agree with that at times, um, for sure. But that's really why I really seek or have a passion for what I do. And I'm really kind of passionate about kind of helping solve this issue um, and kind of limiting this issue. Because when we um, get older, this is not something that we're gonna want to kind of deal with um, in hindsight or but kind of later on, because it might get too, too bad. Um, or to a point where it's kind of hopefully not, um, but beyond, like beyond repair and there's like so much limited that we can do. But right now this issue is completely solvable. So that really gives me motivation and an inspiration right now to just kind of keep um, hammering away at this and really see if we can find a solution. Yeah, I completely agree. So what so what really centers you? Like what do you do to balance out, you know, the work in your free time? Yeah, um, and I'm, I'm gonna ask that question right back at you. But what I do um, is I work out a lot. I'm heavily involved kind of in fitness, um, doing stuff like that. I spend a lot of time with friends and family. It's good to kind of have a balance because you deserve it. Um, and I also, I enjoy being on podcasts. So that's something that when I'm not, when I'm kind of like away from just typing away at my computer or just on long conference calls. I just enjoy hopping on podcasts and just talking, speaking. It's something that I actually enjoy. So it, it works out, works out. What about yourself? What, what do you enjoy doing um, kind of outside of kind of constantly kind of working and kind of mm -hmm. growing your craft and uh, working with your organization? Um, I love music. Like just love it, love it, love it. Um, so I, you know, go like record collecting or like I go on Spotify and just spend hours discovering new music. Um, I'm actually trying to make it like a thing at the moment. So um, having a platform, yeah, having a platform, like a media platform where um, I get to, you know, talk about the people, the musicians, the creatives, the artists that I like at the moment. Um, so yeah, I think I think that's like my main way of just letting it all out. Um, I'm trying to get into fitness. I've, I have like the worst self-discipline when it comes to going to the gym. <laughs> so like it's the money that gets taken from my bank account every every month is like forcing me to go. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, how's that as well? Like self-discipline, because that's a huge part of all this, isn't it? It is, for sure. It definitely is. Kind of just doing something day in and day out. And that's also why it's important to be passionate. But again, you know, you got to be persistent. For sure, for sure. Um, so when I talk about food, um, obviously there's the wealth factor, which is if you're wealthy, you're obviously able to afford like most of foods, more nutritious foods. But I think there are other factors involved as well, right? So um, in the UK, black men are the most likely to develop diet-related ill health. Um, What's that like in the US? Because I, I hear a lot about like if, um, health problems like obesity falling along racial lines. Do you see the same thing? Um, and if so, how does that impact your work? It's very similar. It's very similar. Um, that's why we do a lot of work with inner cities um, and working to kind of bolster um, and improve kind of um, inner cities and health related to inner cities. And we're partnered directly with Catholic Charities. And that was a very strategic partnership, right? To kind of help um, communities in like the Boston, uh, Massachusetts areas, and we're gonna, and Worcester areas, which are two cities in my state. And we're gonna continue to kind of expand. We wanna become nation nationwide in about two to three years. Um, but we really are trying to also educate people because I feel like it's not just an economic thing. But if people have the, um, if people understand what it means to eat healthy, what foods they can avoid, they can kind of 
um, really try to um, personalize that approach as much as possible. Um, just uh, an ec like the economic reason is also a huge um, like factor, but if they don't and can't kind of, um, for economic reasons, get healthy food, they can really try to stay away from certain foods like soda or other foods and maybe mainly drink water. But we're working with kind of nutrition agencies to really kind of um, make strategic planners and guidelines that we can kind of put in public areas. And we're also working with mayors of these areas to kind of utilize um, these surveys and agendas um, and mainstream them, mainstream them to the public. Okay, so I have a hot take based on what you just said. I'm going to like completely play like devil's advocate. I don't believe in choice, right? I don't believe that um, individuals in our society have the choice to eat healthily, particularly young people. Um, I'll tell you why. I think when we're talking about food, um, it's all about blame, right? Like, oh, you're too fat because you're eating too many burgers. You, you're too skinny because you're not eating too much. And it's immediately a thing that we, like, associate with guilt, right? Um, but, like, when you think about climate, 10 years ago, it's people were telling us to switch off their lights and just, yeah, you know, turn, turn your lights off when you leave a room or, you know, wash your clothes at 30 degrees. We realise that that's not big enough of a change to actually, like create the systemic change that we need. I think we need to use the same framework when we're talking about food. So like food is a big industry. It's a huge industry. It's like big pharma, right? In terms of the way that it operates. Yeah. The top 10 companies control 90% of the food we eat. So they are the ones that control the eat, not us, right? Because if I go to a supermarket, at least in the UK, the thing that's most affordable and the thing that's marketed to me most is the chocolate bar no that's de that's definitely true it's definitely when you brought up um food deserts that's another reason why food deserts can be so impactful and so um they can induce so much stress to families in need um and another factor that a lot of people don't think about is the stress that comes from being food insecure it can create really um it can kind of create rifts in families and family dynamics if uh, the mom and dad lose their jobs and they just have such a heavy burden on feeding their families. And that in of itself is also not healthy. So we want to kind of restore families and Catholic Charities is another, is our partnership too, because they work um, in kind of the food housing network and they have people who kind of maybe need a temporary place to stay. Um, so we work with their organization and we're the food distribution people. We go in there and we distribute food and resources. And last year we hit a benchmark of, we distributed about a hundred thousand or no, in, in total this year, um, we, we distributed a hundred thousand dollars worth of food items. Um, so we're kind of really hitting home and making an impact. Um, yes. That's so really, and so you work both top down with government as well as bottom up, right? Distributing, yeah. but, and how, how is that dynamic then? Do you like? Do you find it um, difficult to kind of represent the voices that you're seeing facing this, this issue on the front lines to the people in power? Um, or yeah, like just how's it been generally? Just ha having to be that middleman person connecting, you know, these these vulnerable communities to to these people in positions of power. Yeah, it's um, it's definitely been a process, and it's kind of again taught me so much um about kind of how entrepreneurship works and kind of how we can kind of make the our organization unique from a lot of other nonprofits today um but again some of the people who've been most helpful to our organization and our most strategic donor is jim mcgovern who's a u.s congressman and he's act actually the leading voice on food hunger and food insecurity in the both the u.s and globally so he is both a congressman and he works in kind of uh, activism. So kind of working with kind of mayors, congressmen, senators, you can really build a platform. You can have a voice, um, get on White House conferences, kind of build your path that way and kind of have um, an approach where you're also making an impact at the ground level and really 
um, distributing food on wheels to housing communities and organizations that need it most. In addition to that, um, I would like to bring up fundraising later on because you can't do it without funds. And that's a big part of our approach too. Yeah. Yeah, talk about that a little bit. Like give some advice to some young people that want to start up some nonprofits. How do you go about fundraising and, you know, strategizing? So in our start, um, the first thing you need to do is you need some certifications. Um, that's for another time, but in particular, a 501c3. After we got that, um, it was really about kind of reaching out to different organizations and really acquiring um, a voice so you can kind of reach a wider audience and receive um, kind of almost like a crowdfund approach. Um, after that, what we did is we did grants and grant writing, and that was an extreme process. It took a long, like long periods of time. Um, and through grants, we kind of receive bulk amounts of cash. Um, and that cash um, is used directly to purchase food in need because this organization, it um, is like a car at, with gas. It drains a lot of kind of resources very quickly. Um, and we really want to get it to a, a point where it's almost automated and it kind of can, um, not drain as much or, or bring, bring in just as much as it's taking out. And we're almost at that point right now. Um, and the last thing we did is we looked at colleges and universities. And what we did is we took, um, they have trustees and um, trust trustees and other people who are influential to their organization. And those people kind of provide monthly donations. Um, and a lot of uh, colleges do this, but not a lot of nonprofits. So what we're in the process of doing right now is creating a trustee board to bring in reoccurring um, donations every month. And if you kind of multiply month after month times 12 months times 40 chairmen, that can create a lot of funds just on its own. And on top of that, when we're adding sponsorships and stuff like that, we can really kind of make an impact. Um, question do you do you think that this kind of circular economy that you're creating yeah I, sorry i am interrupting because you lagged for a second so can you like you said it's interesting and then you were gone uh, can you start again okay cool um cool uh i'm not sorry i was saying okay um yeah so I think what you were saying is really interesting about um, kind of creating that self-sustaining cycle. Um, so do you think that food should be free? Um, do you think we should live in a world where that's just something in abundance which anyone can access? Um, and is, is this part of a greater kind of ideology to you? Yeah, I think definitely it should be more affordable. Um, that's, that's a fact. Um, but I don't think it should be free because um, commodities are something that kind of helps our economy and farmers, right? Farmers need to get paid for their services. They have families, they need to kind of support. Um, and, but I think that the pricing around food definitely should be reduced. And we're also gonna, in the future, work with organizations like WIC and SNAP to kind of hopefully work around kind of creating a food stamp that's more um, that's easier to obtain um, and that's more readily available uh, and that should kind of help uh, reduce kind of costs and stuff like that. Cool um, and with your like advocacy journey what's like the most interesting thing you've learned or the biggest lesson you've had? I've learned so much but one of the things that I would say really stood out to me is really kind of having patience and it sounds kind of cliche, but really, um, really having a sense of not just gratitude, but also just um, having like an out, like a tough outer shell and really kind of believing in what you do. After I came back from the Drew Barrymore show, um, it was great. I got a standing ovation, but um, I was, um, I was almost a little bit depressed and anxious because right after that show hit YouTube, um, I got a ton of hate comments um, and stuff like that. Um,
But today that really doesn't bother me because I know and I have a sense of why I do it um, and its importance. But um, I, I don't know about your experience, but like as an influencer and an activist, there's definitely a lot of um, negativity um, surrounding kind of what you do. And that goes for anyone. If you're an influencer, um, an athlete, you definitely have your fair share of kind of backlash. Have you experienced that yourself or what has been some adversity you've gone through in this process? Yeah, I for sure have. Um, I think for me mainly it's just been like the idea of like a you know, young black woman that comes from a family of immigrants asking, you know, the government for money or asking like it's it's been that kind of rhetoric. It's been the most problematic, I think. Um, but yeah, I'm completely immune to like hate comments. I don't care. Um, I think mainly <laughs> it's <awesome>. because <laughs> yeah, I think mainly it's because like when you remember like the reason why you're doing it, that's so much more important than what anyone else has to say. Like this is literally a matter of like hunger, right, and and yeah, insecurity yeah. for people. So so what if people online have some stuff to say like? got it's got nothing to do with the message and i think like that would be my piece of advice for anyone that's kind of afraid of that kind of stuff yeah like just focus on your message like it's so it's so what we're doing is so important um, that's good advice and and have a platform that if something um does go wrong or it does go a little bit kind of out of hand have people in your network people from high and low areas that can really kind of um, help you, whether that be a mentor. Uh, we work with Congress people because they have uh, great platforms that can allow um, to give you advice. Uh, also, we before we even went on the show, we, we contacted the director of the show and he um, was super helpful and they have uh, a way to turn off comments, anything like that. Um, so you can really kind of, it wasn't like the, the impact of the comments, but it was really, we didn't want our voice and the reason of why we do it to kind of get um, turned negative negatively. Um, and we wanted uh, it to be clearly uh, our, our reason and our approach and our mission just to be clear. Yeah, for sure. And I think there's a point to be made there about language and the importance of how you talk about things. Um, I've been heavily trained in framing I think framing is so important and that's why I was speaking about systemic versus individual because each, like food is such a touchy topic right like something that's very close to home very personal to people so you don't want people to feel you know like they they are to blame for, for their predicament so um, I think the way you talk about things as, as young activists as well is like super super important um, yeah um kind of like a final question what's been like the most shocking thing you've learned if that makes sense or like surprising about um it could be anything about advocacy about food systems about working with or like working with an i would say the most surprising thing that we learned was actually in the beginning that there through our facts and our our research that we've done it is we found that there's actually enough food to go around and that's why our organization started knowing that there's hope we can reverse this um crisis we can change this issue and we can really restore um a more just and equitable society for everyone is just such a motivating factor for my brother and i um and is empowering what about yourself what have you found kind of shocking in your journey? Because there's so much that you've learned, that we learn um, every day just from doing this. Yeah, I think I think for me it was um, how impacted I was by the food system. So yeah, I yeah. did a lot yeah. of, yeah, I did a lot of stuff um, beforehand in the climate space and the social justice space. I'd never really thought about food as like a social indicator of poverty. But then I found out I was like, please start around 10 years earlier because of where I lived and like everything changed. And it was just like insane the way you like see things in your life. Um, so I think I think really just like finding out about how wide and, and huge the, the, the food industry is yeah. has been the most surprising thing. 
Um, so the meeting's telling us to wrap up. Is there any kind of last words you want to say to our audience? Oh, um, I don't have any last words, but um, I hope you enjoyed uh, this kind of podcast, this talk, and like uh, visit uh, their website, U Talks. They have a lot of like helpful intro- information if you're like a young activist or leader and you want to get started or you want to learn more about certain issues, um, visit their website. They're great. Uh, loved being here. Um, yeah, same. Thank you so much for listening. Um, we hope you learned something. Great. Right. Have a great day. Bye.